uh, or two hours. Uh, uh, let me introduce Carl. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, so thanks a ton to Jay. Um, so I guess uh, somebody else made this announcement already. So that's oh, Jay's next week. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, right. So as Jay mentioned, and thanks to Jay. So Jay is in fact the only person I'd met here before uh, before this trip, and it's been wonderful. And just to see in how short a time, what a fantastically vibrant group he's built, and this just looks fantastic. So thanks for the invitation again. Glad to be here. Um, so as Jay mentioned, I'm at UC San Diego. I'm also an affiliate of the MBER and JPAL, which is a network of researchers based at MIT, uh, out of MIT, who do randomized experiments in development policy around the world. And this is joint work with Benki from the World Bank. So uh, as Jay mentioned, uh, this is based on a large multi-year, multi-study kind of project. And what I'm presenting today is one piece of this. And I'm happy to talk afterwards about other parts. But what I'm talking about today specifically is teacher performance pay, merit pay, the kind of stuff that uh, we hear about a lot in the US. So why do we care? Maybe I need this slide less in our school of education reform. Uh, but you know, I think it's useful to take a step back uh, to think about how we got to this point in the discussion of where merit pay dominates a very large part of the policy conversation. And I think I mean, a fundamental question in education policy around the world is how do you make your money translate into the best possible outcomes given that there's competing claims on the budget? And the default way people have thought usually about improving schools is, oh, schools need more money. Now, whether this is in the US or whether this is in India, the default conversation in an education ministry is, oh, I increase the budget. Like, I mean, I manage to spend more on schools. Uh, and so that's been the traditional approach. And I think an increasing amount of focus, and in large measure, like I think to work by Rick Hanishek and others over time, documenting the relatively weak connections between spending and outcomes, has kind of forced people to start thinking more seriously about alternative ways of increasing the effectiveness of school spending, particularly by focusing attention directly on outcomes of interest, such as learning levels. And within this paradigm of thinking about outcomes, the biggest variable that people control or that policymakers control is teachers, right? And so hence the strong interest in directly measuring and rewarding teachers based on measures of performance. Um, salaries are the largest component of spending. And several studies show that the factors that are rewarded by the status quo are poor predictors of learning outcomes, right? So policies involving performance pay have been tried in many, many places, including many parts in the US, Florida, Texas, race to the top. Um, but the problem in some ways is, so how do I lose this little guy here? Um, All right. Perfect. Um, but there's limited evidence, right? And of course, these slides were prepared before the Tennessee study, and I'm prepared to talk about that afterwards, and that will be a big point of discussion, I'm sure. But overall, I mean, I think in many ways the policy discussion is a little ahead of the research just because we don't have really good evidence on whether performance pay works and whether the potential downsides could outweigh uh, what the positives might be, right? And the fundamental problem in this literature is the identification of the causal impact. So Figlio and Kenny prior, uh, probably had the best and most comprehensive work on this in the US in terms of looking at a very large sample. Like, I mean, and in the bottom line of their abstract, we'll say that while we find these correlations between schools that have merit pay policies and outcomes, we can't rule out that this is driven by selection factors because this is essentially cross-sectional. Okay? So now this is, of course, a study based in India. So I need to tell you at least a slide about a context in Indian education. And uh, the way you want to think about is you know, it, this, this number often confuses people. When I put this up and say that 60% of kids in India, age 6 to 14, can't read at the second grade level, right? And you're like, but wait, I thought that's where all the software jobs are going, right? Like, I mean, so, so how, how, it does not compute. Um, and, but the way you want to think about this is that when you have a billion person population, I mean, the top 5% of that distribution, like, I mean, it's still a lot of people, and that's enough to kind of compete in, in, in a global scene uh, in terms of uh, uh, high human capital jobs, but the vast majority of the population is still illiterate and functionally illiterate. And while the focus of the government has been on school enrollment, so anytime you think about education in developing countries, so the Millennium Development Goals call for every child to complete primary education. It doesn't say anything about levels of learning, right? So you've got this entire systemic focus on getting kids into school, but nothing that looks at what they're learning, right? So it's only in the past four or five years that systematic outcome-based assessments of, I mean, not in terms of child tracking, but at least sample-based measures of learning have started hit, hitting the media, and you start seeing how stark and grim the situation is, okay? Now, you might be forgiven for thinking that particularly 
So can you hear me in the back row there? It's all good? Okay. And is the speed fine? Because I do talk fast. So if you need me to slow down, <laughs> just put up two hands. Okay. Uh, I'm actually going slow by my standard. So, uh, now, you could be forgiven for thinking, particularly in a place like India that's poor and developing, that maybe this really is a resource issue, right? Like, I mean, that schools don't do well because they're just horribly equipped. I mean, the schools don't have, you know, you don't have desks, you don't have benches, you have kids sitting on the floor, you don't have writing materials, and so really this must be a resource story, okay? Now, the background of how I got involved in all of this work starts with a, a large cross-country project we had done looking at effectiveness of public spending in health and education in developing countries. And one of the main measures we looked at was teacher motivation. And the stunning statistic is that in India, on any given day, about 25% of teachers are absent from work. Um, and absent as in nowhere to be found, right? Like, I mean, so this is kind of uh, based on an all-India survey of over 3,000 schools uh, done in 2003 with enumerators trained by us, 400 enumerators making surprise visits to random representative samples of schools, and we just make a list of every teacher assigned to the school and kind of see, are you there? And 25% are nowhere to be found. There's another 30% in the schools and not teaching, right? Um, and so if you think about the fact that 90% of non-capital spending goes to salaries, that's roughly half your budget down the drain right there, right? Now, this is not to say that resources don't matter, but rather to say that there's potentially low-hanging fruit in improving the effectiveness of what you're spending currently on salaries, which is the largest component of your education bill, okay? And if anything, so the other thing you might think about, oh, developing country, these poor teachers, they must be awfully paid, right? I mean, now, of course, they look poorly paid, but relative to GDP per capita, they're doing pretty well, right? I mean, so teacher salaries are pretty high, four times GDP per capita. So that'd be like about $150,000 a year in the U.S. Now, it's a little, it's a little unfair because... Uh, teachers in any country are drawn from the educated distribution, and so you have fewer educated workers in a developing country, so you're drawing from the right hand, further on the right-hand tail of the ability distribution than you are in a place like the U.S., so that's not a fully fair comparison. But just to put the numbers out there to say that the levels of teacher salaries are not low by any means. Um, and I have another paper showing the effectiveness of contract teachers. But the, what you need to know is that the correlations of anything suggest that the higher paid teachers are the ones who are more absent, right? I mean, so it's not a story about the level of pay. And this suggests really that it's the structure of pay that matters. And I'll tell you more uh, about, about those hypotheses. So performance pay seemed especially relevant in this context, but there's the same issues of identification. And so this paper is based on a large randomized experiment in the Indian state of AP. And I know already that the question going through everybody's mind here is, so how on earth is this relevant to the US, right? Like, I mean, and, and let's park that discussion and come back to that at the end. Um, and all I want to tell you is that I, I, I'm happy to kind of say that this paper is essentially relevant for developing countries, like, I mean, where the levels of learning are low, but that there might be some relevance as we think about design issues in, in, in broader context. And I'll park that discussion until we come to the end, OK? So now the nice thing about setting up an experiment from scratch is that instead of saying, here's the data, what can I do? You can sit back and say, what are the questions I'm interested in, right? And, mean, and then get at a really comprehensive set of questions. So what we're doing in this paper starts with the most basic question of, does teacher performance pay improve test scores? Do kids do better when teachers are paid on the basis of performance, okay? Simple. But I think for economists, what we worry about the most is not I think basic incentive theory tells us that you might expect better outcomes on test scores. But what we really worry about are the negative consequences, right? I mean, so as in, informally, it's not just the economists who worry about this, but formally, the economists worry about this in the context of multitasking. So there's a well-developed literature in incentives and organizations, I mean, that would talk about the distortions that you might get from putting incentives and components of outcomes that you can measure and all the distortions that that can cause, okay? So that's a question we take very seriously, and I'll talk a lot about that, okay? Now, from an incentive design perspective, what you then care about is comparing group versus individual incentives, right? So you could do this at the level of an individual teacher, or you could do this at the group level. Um, and again, theoretically, it could go either way, right? So if you thought free writing was a major problem, you would think individual would do better. But if you thought that cooperation and group production uh, dominated, then you might think the group would do better. So that's an empirical question, and which is why we run the experiment with both treatment arms, with both individual and group incentives. Okay. Now, everything so far is still a very black box treatment, right? I'm telling you, here's the treatment, here's the outcome. But if you really want to understand what's going on, you want to get into the black box and say, how does teacher behavior change? So what do teachers do differently in response to a program like this? Now, the answer to all of this could be 
Yes, the impact was positive. Yes, teachers did more of stuff. But from a policy perspective, that's still not enough to tell you that you should be doing things like merit pay unless you can calculate the cost effectiveness, right? So unless you're able to come back and say, this is how much you get spending on a merit pay program relative to spending on additional school resources, you haven't really answered the cost effectiveness question from a policy perspective. And the answer to all of this could be, this is great, it works, uh, cost effective, but if the teachers and the unions hate the idea, you don't have a chance in hell of getting this done, right? So the last set of questions is, how will teachers respond to the idea, right? So that's kind of, that's the agenda for today, and that's why we need an hour, at least. Okay? Um, so, and um, anyway, okay, so that's, so that's the outline, okay? And I'm going to skip through the literature quickly, right? I mean, there's not that good work, like in the, uh, there's not much well-identified work. I think there's a lot of empirical work with correlations, and a lot of them are suggestive, but not that much well-identified work on the impact of teacher incentives on, on outcomes. There's, I mean, this is something that I put in economics department's talks because, you know, I, I don't want... A general economist thinking about this is, oh, this is about education in India. It's really about incentives and organizations much more broadly, right? There's a large literature on a lot of these themes, and it's very rare that you can run a compensation experiment, like the mean whereby think of a plant with multiple fact production centers, and you're randomly changing the compensation structure. It's really a much broader contribution in incentives and organizations. Um, and then there's, of course, a big literature on resources with incentives in education, okay? So what I'm going to do today is, is there a clock somewhere? I'm gonna um, how are we doing? My watch. Yeah. My watch is one of these weird things that. Science digital. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. The best Walmart has to offer. Fantastic. <laughs> I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna say. <laughs> It's a free watch if you say that, right? Mm. <laughs> uh, okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the theoretical framework. I'm going to spend a lot of time on the design, because I think one of the main contributions here is not just the experimental design, but the design of the incentive pay itself, because I think those are lessons that are much more relevant for the U.S. So even though the context might be different, the theoretical issues are very similar. Um, so I want to spend some time there, and then I'll walk you through the results and a discussion on cost effectiveness, okay? So let's start with kind of the fact that it's not even obvious that performance pay should improve outcomes, right? Because there's a large literature on incentives and intrinsic motivation in psychology that talks about how external incentives can often crowd out intrinsic motivation, right? That this can in fact reduce intrinsic motivation. And one of the best studies on this and most convincing is a very famous study done on blood donations, right? Where basically people found that when you had blood donations, people came and donated blood. And one day some administrators thought, okay, maybe we need to collect more blood, so let's pay people for coming and donating blood. And what do you think happened? Right? So what happened was that the, uh, both the quantity and the quality of the blood collected went down. Right? And the basic point was that as long as people thought that this was a civic duty, that can mean that you were doing out of a sense of being a good citizen, that can mean everybody went and donated blood. But the moment you started paying for it, like, I mean, it cheapened the intrinsic value like, I mean, of donating blood, and so that reduced the quantity. But also the people who came were the people who needed the money, who on average were less healthy, and so that reduced the quality of the blood you collected. Right? So, and maybe it's a bit of a straw man example, but there's a broader point that if you have areas of high intrinsic motivation, that providing external incentives can in fact cheapen the inherent merit of the act and in fact reduce motivation. And this is often something that we hear about in the context of education because teachers are believed partly to enter this profession through notions of intrinsic motivation and wanting to be educators. Okay? Now, but the flip side of the problem is that, and this is what we find in India, is that the lack of differentiation between high and low performers can also be demotivating, right? So one of the most perverse findings in our absence work is that the teachers who report the highest job satisfaction are the teachers who are the most absent. Okay, uh, and, <laughs> and now you say, but wait, like, you know, I mean, job satisfaction is, job satisfaction is supposed to be, oh, I love my job, I come to work, you know, I mean, this is great, but, but basically you talk to the teachers and what you find out is, that, hey, I get my pay, I don't need to show up, I'm really satisfied, right, like, what's, what's the not like, right, it's like, it's like being a tenured professor, no, uh, <laughs> uh, mm, but, hey, that's right, if somebody didn't, <laughs> If somebody did an absenteeism study on me, I'm not at my desk in San Diego, right? Uh, but, 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 
but, but, but there's a deeper point here, right? I mean, and the deeper point is that the people who were dissatisfied were the ones, like, I mean, who work out of intrinsic motivation, who are not recognized in any way, right? I mean, and so the lack of differentiation on the basis of objective measures of performance can also be demotivating, right? So it, it cuts both ways. Now, I think a careful read of the psychology literature on incentive and motivation says that it's a little simplistic, I think, to talk about, oh, external incentives crowd out or crowd in intrinsic motivation. But it really matters. So here's what matters. What the framing really matters, right? So if the external incentives are perceived as exercising command and control on a domain of professional expertise, then that crowds out intrinsic motivation. So if you as a professor are told that tomorrow somebody is going to come and evaluate you on the GRE scores of your students, you're like, duh, they don't come to class, they don't work. I mean, like, how silly is this, right? Now, on the other hand, like, I mean, if you're told, no, we're, we are going to evaluate you, but we're going to evaluate you on a composite measure of publication, scholarly impact, blah, blah, blah. If it's a measure of external incentives that is aligned with your own notion of professional self-identity, like, I mean, then it increases intrinsic motivation. Because the flip side is that if you're in a department with dead wood of faculty who are not doing any research, that's also demotivating. So nobody wants to be the guy doing research in a place where nobody else cares about it, right? So it cuts both ways. And so the main point here is that the, the framing of the program has to be in lines with self-perception of professional identity. And the lesson in the US context, I think, is that by framing merit pay in terms of accountability, you've already lost half the battle by setting it up in an adversarial relationship, like, I mean, between teachers and administrators, right? Whereas if the entire framing is done along the lines of teachers are these hardworking, underappreciated, uh, underappreciated set of workers, and what we're trying to do here is just recognize and reward the outstanding teachers in an otherwise unsung profession, right? Which is essentially the framing of the program in India. And that's going to be very important to see why 85% of teachers love the program, right? Like, I mean, I'm, I'm previewing that result, but I'm just putting this up there, and I'm spending more time on this than I normally would because this is an ed policy audience. Um, but just to say that, even though this is an economics paper and project, we do take seriously, I mean, every one of these concerns, okay? So, the framing matters. So let's now get to the economics of this, which is, again, even those who think that incentives can improve test scores worry massively about distortions to behavior. And that's a laundry list of all the bad things that could happen. Everything from teaching to the test, which is teaching basic as opposed to higher order skills, uh, test prep instead of long-term learning, manipulating the test-taking population. There's many, many things you could do, right? And the extreme would be not teaching to the test, but cheating to the test, right? Uh, so, and that's the laundry list. Now, these are all examples of multitasking, right? Baker, Holmstrom, Milgram. There's a well-established theoretical economics literature in this. But I think one of our main points is that most incentive programs end up being pretty badly designed, and that you can anticipate a lot of these problems. And if you design your program well, you will, in fact, mitigate a lot of these problems. And in the end, it's an empirical question. You can test. You can test to see whether these things happen, OK? So what do we do? So one of the first concerns here is just teaching to the test, right? I mean, an effort diversion. And to which I have three broad responses. OK, the first is that when the levels of learning are so low that 60% of kids can't read, like, I mean, this is probably a red herring, right? Like, I mean, that I don't care if what you're doing is just teaching to the test, if that means the kids are going to read better, OK? But there's a second and deeper response to that, which is that you can make the test design such that you can't do well on these tests without understanding deeper stuff. Now, as an empirical matter, what we do in this project is we hired India's leading test design firm to design the test to our specifications. And what I asked them to do explicitly is to have questions that I call mechanical versus conceptual learning, right? Where the mechanical questions will look like the questions in the textbook, but the conceptual questions will ask the same underlying idea in a completely unfamiliar way, okay? So my favorite example of this is look at area in grade four or grade five arithmetic or geometry. And you give the kids five, three shapes. You give them a rectangle, you give them a triangle, and then you give them a house where you put the same triangle on top of the same rectangle, right? I mean, and they're asked to compute the area. And what do you think happens? Is that less than 50% of kids who get both the rectangle right and the triangle right will get the house right, okay? Um, and the nice thing about using a firm that does test design is then they go and interview a sample of these kids and say, so why can't you do this? So what do you think is the answer? We weren't taught the formula for house. <laughs> we don't know the formula. <laughs> right? So which means that to kids, area is, if you see a rectangle, it's length times breadth. If you see a triangle, it's half base height. But the concept of an area as what is enclosed, that you just add these two numbers that you just calculated, is something they don't know. 
right? So then I've got another example with multiplication. So you give them 37 times 4, like you know, the normal way it's done. And then kids who've learned their tables by heart, you can see them do this, right? They'll go 4, 7, 28, 8, 2, 1, 48. That's about 40% of kids who can do it. But then you ask the same question as 37 plus 37 plus 37 plus 37 equals 37 times what? Okay, now that's again an easier question, right? Because in terms of the order of learning difficulty, we say addition comes before multiplication. You just have to count four and write four. But only 7% of kids get that question right. Because you don't know the concept that addition, multiplication is in fact repeated addition, right? So again, this is the kind of thing that psychometricians and test design guys would enjoy more. But again, I'm mentioning it here in a, in a policy context. So we take the test design very seriously and then it becomes an empirical question, right? Like, I mean, the, do you see gains only in the mechanical components or do you also see the gains on the conceptual components, okay? Um, the other thing we do is the people worry about effort diversion, right? Like, I mean, so if the gains, the bonuses are based on math and language, what about non-incentive subjects, right? So what we do is we also go and do a surprise test at the end of the year on science and social studies, right? So these, this is not in the incentive contract, uh, and the teachers are not being paid on the basis of this. They don't know the test is going to happen. And in fact, what we find is that the kids are doing significantly better, even on the non-incentive subjects. And I'll come back and tell you the mechanisms of what's going on, okay? Now, the second worry and a second set of concerns, and this is again something that you see in NCLB, is the threshold effects, right? So there's this famous notion of the bubble kid and no child left behind, and it's obvious, right? So basic <coughs> economics tells you that if I'm rewarding you based on a threshold, a kid who's doing really well, I don't worry about you because you're going to pass anyway. A kid who's doing really weakly, I don't worry about you because whatever I do, I'm not going to get you to the threshold, right? So our bonus formula is just simply based on an average improvement of every kid. Right? So it doesn't matter where you are in the distribution, you always count because you're being measured on the basis of improvement. So for every kid, you create a target score. That can mean that in the first year, it's just based on your baseline score. And over time, as you have multiple years of data, you can create a predicted score and then do this as a function of the residual of that predicted score. Right? So it's not rocket science to take basic economics and statistics and design a program that will take care of many of these issues. Okay? Uh, now, a related worry is one about teachers, if I do this on the basis of average gains, so would teachers game the system by getting weaker kids to drop out, right? Like, I mean, so in the U.S. context, that would be, do I disproportionately classify kids as ESL? Or like, I mean, do I do, do I play games on them? So Julie Cullen, I think, had this paper in Tinkering Towards Accolades, like, you know, which is all about tinkering on the eligibility margins, right? So again, we do something very simple, which is any kid who's in the baseline test, I mean, who does not show up to take the endline test, is automatically scored as a zero in terms of improvement. Right? So you can never do worse than by having a kid drop out. Okay? So it's the bonus formula is done in a way that you'll never get penalized more than you will for a dropout. Now we don't penalize you draconianly because there's always some cases of absence that are not in the teacher's control. All we care about is putting enough of a disincentive that you don't game the test taking population. And that's again an empirical question that we can come back and test. And it turns out that there's no difference. Okay? And then the final part, and this is probably in a policy context what I worry about the most, <coughs> which is just cheating, right? Um, and there's a reason, I think the New York Times had this big article on cheating in China uh, yesterday. And, you know, I mean, India might not be as bad, but we're not much better off, right? Like, I mean, uh, I think we're better at the higher end, but in terms of primary schooling and stuff, like, people just copy from each other. It's not a problem. So here, every test is proctored externally, and so it doesn't affect the validity of our results. But from a policy perspective, that would be my biggest caveat, right? If tomorrow we were talking about scaling up, that's the part I'd be most concerned about, is can you maintain the integrity of a system that, re that depends on something like that? Okay? So, the location of the study is the Indian state of Andhra Pradesh. And for those of you who weren't at dinner with me yesterday, the way you want to think about India is, you know, it looks like a one little state. But that's 80 million people. Okay? So that's about a quarter of the U.S. That's bigger than Germany, bigger than Spain, bigger than France, bigger than the U.K. Um, and so it's bigger than any European country, right? So the way you want to think about India is think about it like Europe, where every state is a large European country with its own language, own literature, own cuisine, own football team, right? I mean, so it's, it's a big deal. Okay? And uh, the good thing about being an AP is we ended up in AP kind of accidentally because the education secretary there invited us. But exposed, it ended up being a good state because it looks a lot like the All India averages and a whole bunch of human development measures. So if you want to think about a representative state in India, AP is a remarkably good state okay, to be studying. So what's the design of the incentive, like I said? Uh, the bonus payments are over and above regular pay, right? So there's no stick here. Uh, if, if we could have sticks, then we'd love to try that. But if you think unions in the U.S. are strong, you have no idea until you've come and seen teacher unions in India, okay? Uh, okay, um, you, you, 
you can't touch them with a 10-foot pole, so anything that had to be done had to be over and above, right? Like, I mean, so it was based on gains in math and language. The papers were designed by this independent testing agency, that's Education Initiatives, and conducted by an independent nonprofit, which is the Primji Foundation. So I'm happy to talk a little bit more because in some sense, the biggest miracle here is like how we pulled off this project. Like, I mean, something of this scale, and I'm happy to talk a little bit more about the role of the foundation and how this whole thing was negotiated and pulled through, okay? Um, the bonus formula is very straightforward. And this is, again, a very important f feature of design. So I, I was just reading this paper, in fact, that was presented at the PEPG conference in June about this experimental evaluation of a New York bonus, right? I mean, on group incentives that didn't find any effect. And I think the conclusion Turner and Goodwood, I think, right, or something like that, um, was that because of the group incentives and the way it was designed, like, it wasn't going to work. But I think the other main problem, if I remember, was that if you met a threshold, you got a $3,000 bonus. I mean, and that was it, right? So there's no incentive for continuous improvement. Whereas if you think basic theory would tell you that you want everybody across the board to be exerting more effort, so you want to make this continuous in improvement. So you don't want to make it things like tournaments that have fixed prizes for being the best. Uh, now, there are a lot of theoretical issues in how you design tournaments, piece rates, whatever, but in terms of transparency, you just want to make it as linear in the improvement as possible, right? Uh, so. It was based on a 500 rupee bonus for every one percentage point improvement above a target, and that was changed to a student-specific target in later years. And the expected bonus is not a big amount of money. So this is the other big thing, right? The average bonus paid was about 3% of annual pay. So in the US context, that'd be about 1000 to $1,500 a year, um, so about 35 to 40% of a month's salary, which is not that different from private sector bonuses. So we're not talking $10,000, $15,000, $20,000 bonuses. The average bonus, even relative to base pay, is pretty small, OK? Now, so let's talk a little bit about, for the economists in the room, a little bit about the theory, right? Like, I mean, an absolute versus relative improvements. So the main problem with trying to do this as a tournament, right, like, is that you get big nonlinearities uh, as a function of your rank, okay? So what that means is in a dynamic sense, if you do this as a tournament in improvements, you have an incentive to take a dive in one year and then show all your gains in the next year, right? So uh, this Holmstrom-Milgram Econometrica 87 has this optimal incentives and dynamic contracts kind of paper that establishes theoretically that your best contract is typically linear uh, in improvements, so you don't have incentives to dynamically shift the timing of when you're showing the games, okay? Um, and there's, it's much greater transparency to the teachers. Now, the one big advantage of a tournament is budgetary predictability ex ante, right? Because then you know exactly how much you're going to have to pay, whereas here, if the, bo if the performance is more, then you need to pay more, right? There is a way to solve that problem, which is to kind of, anyway, so I'll talk about that later. But the main thing you need to keep in mind here is that it's linear, it's continuous, and it's every point of improvement matters, and every kid matters, right? So when we come back in the discussion about why do things, why are we finding different things in Tennessee, New York, et cetera, I mean, part of this is context, but part of this is also things that have not necessarily been designed with the best first principles of eliciting effort at all parts of the distribution. Okay. Uh, and then, like I said, we do both group and individual incentives. All right? So the overview of this entire project, like I said, is that the big picture design is looking at resources versus incentives, right? Where the inputs here are provided unconditional. So this is the way government <coughs> operates, right? So Let's give you more money to do X, Y, Z, okay? That can mean, and this is the part that's new, which is incentives conditional on improvement in learning. And the entire amount of spending was calibrated so that the expected ex ante spending was the same in each of these four cells, right? So then you get a direct comparison between different ways of spending this money. And within incentives, we study group versus individual. Within inputs, we study teacher versus materials, right? I mean, and now the only third class of inputs that we couldn't study would be infrastructure, because that would have to be evaluated over the depreciation life of the capital. And so here it's designed to be flow versus flow in each of the cells of what's being compared. Okay? Uh, so today's paper is just talking about these guys, and I'll only bring this result in for the cost-benefit comparison, but we've also got two very nice papers on these two, particularly the block grant is what we were talking about in the morning of, uh, of the does money matter type of stuff. And I'm happy to preview those results later. Okay? So now one, so this um, so let me say something about sampling and take a step back and address one potentially big criticism of experiments, right? So Heckman and Smith have this very influential JEP paper in 95 talking about how experiments significantly sacrifice external validity for internal validity, which is that if 
the teachers have to agree to be part of this experiment, and if the experiment has to be negotiated through a complicated political process, then the teachers who are part of this experiment are not typical teachers. Are teachers like, I mean, and so even if you find a result that's valid in that population, how can you be sure about extrapolating that result, right? Now, to the best of my knowledge, this is the first large-scale experiment that has random assignment in a representative sample of schools, right? Which means that every one of 60,000 schools in the state had the same ex-ante probability of being in the universe of the study. And then conditional on being in the study, you were equally likely to be assigned to any of these five treatment arms, right? So the random assignment, the second stage gives you internal validity, but the random sampling, the first stage gives you external validity because you can extrapolate to the entire universe of schools in the state, right? So the way the sampling is done is that the state is divided... <clears throat> historically has three very distinct social cultural regions. Um, think of them again as the French and Flemish speaking parts of Belgium, like they almost like don't like each other. In fact, the Telangana, that area in red, is trying to secede and become its own state. So, it's, <laughs> so regional radiation matters. Okay, and then what we do is in each district, we sample two districts. The districts are proportional to population, so there's two, two, and one, so that's five districts. In each district, we randomly sample ten sub-districts. And in each sub-district, we randomly sample 10 schools, right? So it's 10 times 10 times 5, which is the universe of 500 schools. And then the randomization is stratified down at the sub-district level. So remember I said in each of 50 sub-districts, we have 10 schools. And those 10 schools, if you go back to this picture, are sitting 2, 2, 2 in every one of these five cells, right? So what that means is every sub-district is a microcosm of the aggregate study. And that's important for two reasons. So one, you get a lot more statistical precision by doing this with sub-district fixed effects, right? Because you're wiping out a lot of noise. That's geographical variation. But the second thing is it insulates you against other programs that the government or other nonprofits or somebody else might be doing. Because typically, the lowest level at which these programs will roll out will be across the entire subdistrict, right? Like, I mean, so you'll never, because the subdistrict is the lowest administrative level. So you'll never have another government program that is run at a level below a subdistrict, right? So even if there's something else going on, I'm netting all of that out, right? I mean, with subdistrict fixed effects, right? So that's another design feature that you don't need ex ante, but ex post, it's a very useful thing to have, okay? So this is the big picture of the design. And this is just a picture. Like, you know, I realized, like, I mean, nobody in this room has probably seen an Indian school, right? And so we managed to pull out a couple of pictures just to give you some context, right? So these are small rural government schools, okay? These are two-room schools, three-room schools. Um, and the context here is an education policy apparatus that prioritizes access, right? So the government wants to put a school within one kilometer of every habitation in the country to make sure that distance is not a barrier to first-generation learners. And there is good evidence to think that distance elasticity to education attendance is very large for de in, in developing countries. But the cost of that is that the typical school is pretty small. It's about 80, 80 to 100 kids. And the typical school has about two teachers or three teachers. So these are small groups. And you have one teacher teaching multiple grades, um, math, language, whatever the subjects might be. So this is primary education. So a typical school will probably have three teachers. Okay, so this is one classroom here inside. You pass a door, and then there's another classroom there. This is a blackboard. This is a blackboard. And if you have four teachers, so the third teacher teaches outside here, so it's covered on three sides. So this is actually a pretty good school building. Okay, like I mean, uh, so just to get your heads around developing country education, right? And if you had a fourth teacher, then the fourth teacher would teach facing this area, right? And so this board then becomes, so a class would get broken up, so the class faces the other side, okay? So this is pretty, pretty bleak, right? I mean, it's not kind of fancy schools that you're thinking about. And this is a picture from our testing to show you, like, I mean, so that's one of our proctors, right? Like, I mean, and uh, the kids kind of sit far away, far away enough so you can't actually copy from each other, like, I mean, and that's how the exams are proctored. Useful, no, to have those pictures? <laughs> Just get your head around. It's a completely different world we're talking about. Okay. Uh, have you seen the new RFK school in LA? <laughs> <laughs> no. You live there. San Diego, no, but what is it? Is it like $580 million? Club Med. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Okay, so that's that's the context. All right, so let me just summarize the experimental design. Okay, and let me pause here for questions and then get straight to results. So the study is done across a representative sample of 500 primary schools. Um, conduct baseline tests in June, July, 05. So at the time of the baseline, nobody knows this is going to happen, right? Because if you know that, then you could game the baseline if this is based on improvements from the baseline, right? So the baseline test simply says that an assessment of learning is going to take place that is being conducted by the foundation and the government. Um, the learning test happens, and then the randomization is done, and then you communicate the treatments to the schools uh, 
So you do the randomization about six weeks into the school year, and you communicate that in early August. And then we monitor these process variables of teacher attendance and all kind of ongoing stuff by uh, having our staff go to the schools and make surprise visits. We do two rounds of tests at the end of the year. And there's psychometric reasons for that because that allows you to cover more material, allows you to do vertical linking over time and all kind of IRT stuff that I don't need for these results, but that we can do, okay? And then we interview the teachers after the program, but before the outcomes are communicated to them. And you'll see why that's important. And then we provide the bonus payments and then communicate the continuation of the program for a second year, okay? So that's, it's a two-year study. That's it. Is up. Questions? At what point did you have a detailed enough conversation with the teachers that they understood what the game was? Very good question. Now, what happened is, mm, in designing the program initially, like as in the broad ideas of performance link pay, we had focus group discussions with multiple groups of teachers who weren't necessarily in the study. Right? And then the way the entire study was done is the foundation. So let me take a step back and emphasize the role of the Azim Premji Foundation, right? So they are like the Gates Foundation of India. Uh, okay, so it's literally that's that's what you want to think about them as, um, and they have a lot of credibility in education. So a program they run programs of various sorts, and so a program that they would communicate would be something that the teachers would take seriously. The other thing is that. The foundation played a critical role in the politics of the project in the following sense, right? That even though the secretary was very keen on the study, like after six months of discussion, he said, oh, by the way, I can't randomize, right? I'm the government. Like, I mean, there's no way I can give some things to some schools and not to others, right? Uh, but then everybody recognizes that nonprofits have limited budgets, right? So nobody expects a nonprofit to work across the board. And so then to say that politically, that we are going to choose the schools by lottery because it's the fairest way to decide who gets to participate, works both politically and from a research design perspective. And then coming back to the communication, so the communication is written letters that go out under the joint signature of the government district official and the foundation project manager that explains in detail, that says, we've done this baseline testing and we're going to reward like on the basis of performance of the following sort, but it's not just a written letter. A foundation program officer visits every school, like I mean, and spends time walking through the letter, through the details, answering questions, and they also visit the school ongoing throughout the year, so teachers have plenty of opportunities to ask if they have any questions. But I think the broader answer to your question is, did the teachers understand the exact formula? Did they understand the micro details? Probably not, right? But I think the foundation was credible enough that when the when it was presented as a program that was going to reward outcomes and that you're giving them very detailed reports of the baseline scores and you say this is how your kids have done and we're going to come back and measure you. Now it's important to know that the control group has exactly the same amount of measurement and monitoring, right? So the control group gets an identical letter, they get the baseline test, they get the feedback report and they're told the same thing that we're providing you these feedback reports to help you improve learning outcomes and we're going to come back and test you at the end of the year and we're going to come and measure. So the measurement and monitoring is identical. Now I have a separate paper, it was here, about just looking at the impact of measurement and monitoring, right? Like I mean, and so the way we do that is again, it works because of random assignment in a representative sample, right? So what happens is at the end of the first year, we sample an extra hundred schools that are completely outside the project, and then we go and do an end line test over there. And the randomization means I don't need a baseline. So those schools don't have a baseline, don't have the report, don't have the monitoring, don't have the feedback, and we compare the controls versus the pure controls, right? And we find that there's in fact no impact whatsoever, right? That can mean of this diagnostic feedback, which is a separate paper that's just out in the EJ. Uh, so we can talk about that as well. But, it, so coming back to the program itself, the communication is written and oral with ample opportunities for clarification. Did, Sorry, uh, to follow up, go ahead. Yeah, did, did your control group no. know that somebody else was going to get paid for the increase and they won't. So, in the first year, probably not. Like, I mean, because the schools are far away enough. These are rural. So, the randomization is usually done at the village level. Like, I mean, so it's very rare that schools are adjacent or nearby other treatment schools. But over two years, I mean, I'm sure, like, through unions and other discussions, I mean, there was a sense that there's this program. But that's why it's important to know that even though 500 schools is a huge sample, it's still only 1% of the schools in the state. And so it's in that sense seen as, okay, here's another program that's going on. But here's another important thing, is the control schools are not called control schools. The control schools are called feedback schools, right? Because they're getting these detailed diagnostic feedback reports. So the framing is that you are also getting something that's very valuable, which is true because the testing firm would charge an arm and a leg for these reports on a commercial basis, right? So it's certainly true that in the long run, maybe control schools got extra disgruntled because they weren't getting the program, but that's why the pure control helps, right? So I have the pure control where nothing is done, and then I can go there and show you that, listen, there's really no difference here whatsoever, right?
But to implement this program, you do not need the consent of the unions. The unions pick this up later. Uh, right, and the reason, and this is the nice this thing. This doesn't sound like you, you, you're saying the Indian unions are more powerful. It sounds less powerful if you could implement a gigantic random assignment merit pay program and they don't even know about it, let alone have to consent to it. It's a good question, and I think. So at one level, the administrative apparatus, which are the senior administrative officers, like, I mean, have a lot of power to innovate and do little things, right? But when it comes to negotiating policy change of any sort, that's when the unions would enter the picture. I think the reason this flew under the radar, like, I mean, is because it's, at the end of the day, less than 1% of all the schools. And there's no shortage of nonprofits coming in and doing a range of programs, right? But typically, nonprofits come in, oh, we'll give you books, oh, we'll give you this, oh, we'll give you that, right? Like, I mean, so in the political presentation of this was, oh, here's another program, like, I mean, that this nonprofit is piloting. The fact that there was so much research and everything going underneath was probably not appreciated as much, but, you know, that's probably not that big a deal in terms of getting the program through. But if you had to do a policy level thing, then the unions would would, yeah, so they'd be central in the picture. Okay, so how am I doing on time? Uh, aha, all right. So the nice thing though is like, I mean, once I've gotten through most of the design, the results kind of speak for themselves and I can go through that pretty quickly. Okay, so unlike a typical economist paper, there's exactly one equation in this entire, <laughs> <laughs> uh, in the, in the, in this entire paper and that's what the random assignment does for you, right? Like, I mean, which is, there's this beautiful delta, like, I mean, that's the incentive schools and the ZMs are the sub-district fixed effects that absorbs a whole bunch of variation and then you've got standard errors clustered up at the school level. Uh, and there's one-year effects and two-year effects. You can also do two-year on one year, the second-year effect, but that's not an experimental estimate, right? So we'll come back. So this is the punchline, okay? So punchline is that after one year of the experiment, so this is math, this is language, and then I'm showing you this combined, okay? After one year of the experiment, the incentive schools do about 0.15 standard deviations better, right? Uh, and that's, that, that's a big number. Um, and at the end of two years, it's about 0.22 standard deviations. And you, if you were to look at the second year effect alone, uh, that is 0.14. And the nice thing here is that you can't reject that the effects are basically the same, right? Like, I mean, in both the years of the program. But the reason the combined two-year effect is not equal to the sum of this is because you're decaying, like, I mean, previous year gains, right? So the way you want to, so this guy is basically this times this plus this, right? Uh, so in a capital in a capital equation, you want to think about gross investment, depreciation, and net investment, right? So this is the net two-year effect of the program. Okay. Now, at this point, I'm pooling group and individual, and I'll separate them out later. Okay. Uh, right now, it's done with uh, all incentive schools together, and then you see that the math effects are significantly bigger than language. Right. This is about 0.28 standard deviations, which that's a huge number. That's like nine percentile points, right, in two years of a program, and language is about 0.16. And this is consistent with a lot of other developing country studies, and the basic logic. I mean, not that we have proof of this, but it seems that the most likely mechanism is that. School inputs are a larger part of the, la of the math production function because home inputs matter a fair bit for the language production function. So a school level intervention will see a larger impact on math than language, right? So that seems the most plausible story, okay? Now, this is just a very simple story of mean effects, right? Now, a lot of the technical work in the paper is really about distributional effects, right? And so what I'm gonna do now is just skim through some of these big issues, okay? And what I'm showing you is quantile treatment effects, okay? Where the quantile treatment effect is just plotting the end line distribution at the end of two years of the program by percentile of test scores. And what you see, the first thing you wanna see is that the incentive distribution is basically completely above, right? The control distribution, which tells you that this first order stochastically dominates the control school distribution. So this is not just average gains with some kids being worse off, but that no kid is worse off, right, in the, in, in the entire program. So that's the main message. But the other thing you see is that there is increasing variance, right? Like, I mean, so at the high end, you see that the gains are very big. At the low end, like, I mean, there's almost no, no differential gains. So we'll come back and talk a little bit about what that means in terms of the increased variance of test scores at the end of two years. Okay? Now, the next thing you look at is if, are there heterogeneous treatment effects as a function, and I'm sorry the table's very dense, uh, are there heterogeneous treatment effects as a function of various pre-existing characteristics? And so the equation is very simple, right? You just have the treatment, you have the covariate, you have the interaction, and you're just testing a linear model of it, significant interactions. And the main story here is the dog that did not bark, right? You can mean, so at the end of two years, there's, you see some differential impact on household affluence. But if that's one covariate out of eight, I don't want to make too much out of that, because that could just be sampling variation, right? So the one I care about the most is this last guy here. Right, this is the baseline test score, 
right? Because the baseline test score is a good summary statistic of all cumulative inputs that you've received in education up to that point. And so do you see differential effects as a function of initial test scores? And the answer seems to be no. Okay, so this we take more seriously and do non-parametrically, right? So now what I'm plotting here is, uh, so again, I, I don't, I, am I getting too technical? No, right? I mean, so, let's, so yeah, I guess non-parametric stuff is fine. Okay, no, <laughs> no, no, I mean, but, uh, but, but once, uh, yeah. It's always good to check, right? So, but basically what this guy is, and I think this is the most powerful of these pictures, right? Because what this is showing is this is the percentile of the baseline score, and this is the year two normalized test score in the control group and the treatment group, right? So what you see is that at every point of the baseline distribution, there is a difference of at least 0.1 standard deviations in terms of the mean, in terms of the treatment effect. And this guy is mostly flat with a slight downward trend, and this is why that interaction, that linear interaction is zero. But in the non-parametric, you can see it more clearly about what's going on broadly, okay? But so now here's a puzzle. The puzzle is that I'm showing you here that there's not much of a difference based on initial test scores, but I showed you in the initial picture that there's an increase in variance, right? So where is the increase in variance coming from? What do you think? So it turns out that the increase in variance is coming from heterogeneity in teacher responses, right? So imagine a story, like I mean, where the distribution of test scores is comparable across 100 classrooms at the beginning, right? But some teachers respond much better than others. So then what you're going to see is you're not going to see a connection with baseline test scores if the distribution of test scores at the beginning of the program is not correlated with, uh, is not correlated with the program, and that's true. So you would get an increase in variance because some teachers now are doing a lot more, but that variance is not a function of initial test scores, right? So now what we do is we then run a bunch of teacher fixed effects regressions, right? Like, I mean, and so this is now plotting the percentile of teacher effectiveness. So you all know what a standard teacher fixed effect specification looks like, and we're taking the teacher residual and then plotting that by percentile of the teacher fixed effect. And now what you see is really interesting, right? So for the bottom 20% of the teachers, the treatment makes almost no, has no impact. For the middle 40%, it's positive with a 5% confidence interval just about kissing zero. And then from the, the top 40% of the teachers are where you see large and consistent gains. Now, of course, this is not top in terms of initial performance. This is just top in terms of their responsiveness to the program. Right? Because I don't have prior program data to calculate pre-existing value add. Right? So in a way, this is the analogy to the quantile treatment effects with teachers. But I, don't, I can't do this as a function of baseline uh, teacher fixed effects. But it still tells you that the variance is basically being driven by variance at the teacher level and not by variance as a function of initial student achievement. Mm -hmm. So now the next question is, having shown you the variance, is what are the correlates of this variance, right? So I can do the same heterogeneous treatment effect table, but now as a function of teacher characteristics, right? And say, do different teachers respond differently? And can I predict what type of teachers are going to respond differently, okay? So the first and main and interesting story is that you, this is negatively correlated with base pay. Okay, which is not surprising, because we weren't able to randomize the intensity of the treatment, right? Like, I mean, but given a given bonus, it's a smaller share of total pay for teachers with higher base pay, right? Like, I mean, so the program has less intensity for a teacher with higher base pay, so that's a natural mechanism for why this guy is negative, right? But the problem in that interpretation is that base pay is highly correlated with experience, okay? Like, I mean, so with experience, that's also negative. So one story is that the magnitude of the incentive matters. The other story is that young teachers respond better to any program, while old and jaded teachers can't be made to budge. Okay? Like, I mean, so those are both consistent. But here's the part I find really, really interesting. Okay? If you then look at the interaction with teacher education and teacher training, education and training don't show up at all in the levels regression. Right? So the covariate is basically insignificant. But the interaction ends up being positive and significant at the 10% level. And why is that so important? It's so important because it tells you that teacher human capital matters, provided they have the incentives to, in fact, use that human capital. So it's not that educate. So you know, the, in some sense, incentives and inputs are not mutually exclusive, but the, the incentives are a force multiplier for the use of the existing inputs you have in the system, including inputs like teacher training and teacher experience and teacher qualifications. So the, the more qualified teacher has the potential to be better, but doesn't exercise their potential in a business as usual setting. And I think that's a very, very important finding. Okay? So, 
as you can see, this is why, I mean, I can, I can do this for months. Okay, but, I, <laughs> all right, so mechanical, conceptual, and skipping through this, I've shown you these examples, right? But the main punchline here is that you see significant and basically indistinguishable gains on both the mechanical and conceptual components. Okay? Now, all right, I'll, I'll come back to a couple of other things. And now let's look at non, non-incentive subjects. So this is, in some sense, the most convincing, right? So science and social studies. There's no incentive contract. There's nothing whatsoever. It's a surprise test. I mean, you go there and do the surprise test. And you still see gains that are significant in the incentive schools. Now, in the second year, it's not a surprise. But they know from the first year that this was not used in the bonus calculations. Right? So it's a credible SAT test, test module. Okay? Now, one interesting question here is what is the mechanism here? Okay? What is the mechanism for these spillovers? Because basic economics would kind of say, nah, you know, it's not computing, okay? That the incentives in math and language, why are they doing better in science and social studies, right? So there's three possible stories. One is that if teacher attendance went up, right, then they just came and they taught, they came and taught more of everything, right? So that's just a positive spillover. It turns out that's the one b- bad news, that attendance does not go up, okay? I'll come, to I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that, okay? Now, the other extreme story is that it's just test taking skills, right? Like, I mean, so if kids are learning to take tests better, then that's going to translate into these other non, non-incentivized domains. And then there's the intermediate story, which is what I believed, which I now have proof of, right? And the intermediate story is very simple, is that even if a teacher rationally focuses mostly on math and language, if you read better, that's going to spill over, like you mean, onto these other subjects. And we can now prove that. So this is not in the paper, but this is a nice additional analysis in response to, to, to revision request. What we can do is we can look at the predicted scores from the baseline, right? So from the baseline, you can use that to predict the end line score and create a residual, right? Now, to some extent, the entire treatment is the residual on the math and the language, right? So what we're doing here is we're putting in the scores and the, res- the predicted scores and the residuals as regressors in the science and social studies regression, okay? And there's two things you want to see. One is that the incentive coefficient now goes away to zero, right, in the science and social studies regressions. So what's that telling you is that the mechanism, like, is through the improvements in math and language. That's one. But the second thing which is very powerful is that the language residual is always bigger, like, I mean, than the math residual, except in this one case, which kind of, again, suggests that the mechanism is that if you're reading better, that that spills over more, right, like, I mean, into the non-incentive domain. Okay? And the, the, the one other request from the referees was to kind of say a little bit more about this not just being test-taking skills. I mean, so now what we've done is we've gone and done analysis at the individual item level, and we've distinguished between multiple choice and free response. So if you taught test-taking skills, you just taught them never to leave a multiple choice blank, you know, some basic stuff like that. Uh, but we find that there's slightly bigger gains in multiple choice, but you can't reject uh, that there's gains across all types of questions, and there's no difference between the gain in multiple choice versus the free response. And then the other thing we can do is look at, because there are some repeat items, because of the IRT stuff, you can look at repeats versus non-repeats, and again, you find that there's significant gains across the board. Okay, so. Now, the story on group versus individual is that in the first year, there's basically no difference, okay? Um, and, you know, one hypothesis we had was that maybe you'd get some kind of inverted U relationship as you interact with the group incentives with the size of the school, right? That as you went from one to three, the gains of cooperation were big and peer monitoring could take care of free writing, but as you got bigger, that the free writing would dominate. But the problem is there isn't enough variation in school size. Like 92% of schools have between two and five teachers, so there's just not enough power to pick that up, okay? Now, in the second year, you see that the group starts, the individual starts breaking away from the group, right? So the first year effect is almost the same. The second year effect, the individual gets better, and the two-year effect of the individual is almost significantly higher than the, than the group, right? But I can't say much more about it than that, which is to say that it looks like individuals probably going to be better, and even in, but again, this, these are very small groups of three teachers or four teachers. And so if the groups are bigger, then it's almost to be a no-brainer that you're not going to see any effect, right? Like, I mean, you can't do group incentive pay and pool like 30 teachers together and somehow say, now, if what you're doing is putting high power rewards for the principal on a group basis, that might make sense because from a design perspective, the principal then has the information to act on his high-powered incentives. But a group-based bonus for a group of, a large group of teachers, if you're seeing this fade out even with three or four, it's unlikely, in my view, that can mean that you would see large effects with group base, with group base. Okay, so now let's get into kind of opening up this black box and say like, what did the teachers do differently, okay? Now here's the bad news. Like I said, the absenteeism rate is like 
rock solid at 24%. Uh, it doesn't change. I mean, they're just not, I mean, and even though we go visit the schools, we do all kinds of stuff, I mean, it just doesn't change, all right? Um, now, but it looks like what is happening is we then also ask teachers unprompted questions. Like, we just say, what, what did you do differently this year? Okay, and we just ask for their self-reports. And what you see they're saying is mostly what you would expect. It's not rocket science. I mean, it's just more of the same. It's more homework, classwork, extra classes and teaching beyond school hours, practice tests, and paying special attention to weaker kids. Okay? Now, the reason this is not cheap talk is you might say, okay, this is just cheap talk. I mean, you ask them what they did and they said what they thought you wanted to hear. There's two answers to that. First is notice that no, no, the answer to none of these is above 50%. So it's not something the teachers feel compelled to report that they did. But the second thing is I can take each teacher's individual response and correlate that with student value add, right? Like, I mean, and you find that each of these responses are in fact positive and significantly correlated with the learning outcomes. I mean, so it's not pure cheap talk. So the economics here, I think, is that if your model of attending school or being absent is that there's uh, the outside opportunity cost of time is high that day, right? I mean, you miss the bus, your child is sick, or you know, you have some other business that needs you that day. A bonus at the end of the year is not changing your attendance calculus, like I mean, on a given day, but conditional on showing up, you exercise more effort, right? Like I mean, that the margin is on the attendance effort intensity, conditional on attendance, and not so much on attendance, right? So that seems to be the mechanism. Okay, so comparison of inputs and incentives, um, and you know, there's a there's a beautiful story to be told in those two input papers. There's just a, not, not enough time. But the main punchline here is even in one year, you see the incentives outperform the inputs and are significant at the 10% level. And at the end of two years, the incentives blow the inputs out of the water. They can mean by a factor of almost three to one. Okay? And in fact, it turns out that even though ex ante, the spending was calibrated to be identical, we spend a little less in the group incentives because teachers with negative gains like bring down the mean, whereas in the individual incentives, even with the same distribution, you truncate that distribution at zero, right? Uh, and so you end up spending a little less in the group incentives. So on a cost equivalent basis, these incentives are about three times more effective. Okay? But here is, I think, the deeper policy calculation is that in a way, even this overstates the cost of the incentives, right? Because I'm paying the bonus, but bonuses are just another way of raising pay, right? So imagine that I have every year a cola, right? Like, I mean, so you've got a 3% cola that's going across the board, and then you just say this year, like, I mean, instead of an across-the-board inflation hike for 3%, you're going to get a performance-based thing that goes from 0 to 6%. So in that case, the, the cost is only the risk premium, right? Because the expected wage is the same, so what economic theory would tell you is that the cost of that is a lot less than the actual cost of the bonus, right? Now, there is, of course, the administrative cost of implementing this, which needs to be accounted for, uh, but even after you do that, very comprehensively, it can mean it turns out that the incentives significantly outperform in terms of cost effectiveness. Okay. So this is, I think, you know, the politically important point, like I said, and the reason I spent time on these issues of framing and transparency. And so this is now a separate paper because the, I think the response from the editor was that paper was already too long. So he said, cut, he said, cut this out. Um, so this is, in fact, the, uh, so the, Pepsi, uh, the Pepsi thing that we attended. So we now have a separate paper just in teacher opinions and performance pay that kind of fleshes out these issues in a lot more detail. Okay? So, but there's two, reasons, two things I want to call to your attention. One is the high level of general support. Uh, but the second thing is you might say, but wait, what's to not like because you're just getting more money, right? Like, so what we do is we frame the question in an expected wage neutral way. And the way the question is asked is the way public, uh, public pay scales in India work is every 10 years, the government sets up what they call a pay commission that then recommends civil service pay scales, right? Um, so the question we ask is saying, the sixth pay commission has just been set up by the government and assume that they have a budget to allow 15% hike in teacher salaries. Now, you can get this hike in any of four different ways, ranging from 15% across the board to 10% across the board and the remaining based on performance. And so you keep increasing the spreads, right? To like, and to on the extreme, you say nothing across the board, and the entire pool goes into a performance-based spread from 0 to 30%. So you're asking teachers, and this is why it's important that we ask these questions before they know their own performance, right? Because otherwise it's just by, oh, I did well, this is great, right? So you ask them for their opinions before they know their bonuses and their performance. And what's really neat is that the teachers who show the greatest ex-ante support for a mean-preserving spread of pay are the ones who exposed to, in fact, have done the best, right? So what that tells you is the good teachers know who they are, and they're willing to put their money where the mouth is. And so that has a lot of implications for sorting into the profession. 
So in the long run, if you think of the Lazier results from Safe Light Plus, that's the AR2000, that about half the gains to performance pay come not from higher effort of those who are already on the job, but from attracting higher ability folks into the profession. Right? So then what we're picking up here is a lower bound on that long-term effect. Okay? So of course, we're not measuring that, but we're just indicating that good teachers know who they are, and they're more likely to be willing to respond to performance-based spreads. Okay. So the summary of the results is incentive schools perform significantly better. The improvements are across the board, all grades. Not bad, yeah, on the dot. <laughs> 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 all right. Uh, on, budget, <laughs> on budget. On yeah. budget, Significantly better, across the board, all grades, districts, baseline scores, first order stochastically dominate, which means nobody's doing worse off. And there's limited evidence of heterogeneity of effects at the student level, but considerable evidence of heterogeneity across teachers. Right? Um, we don't find any, any evidence of negative effects. right? So the three or four types of negative effects, so one of them I didn't mention was, because I didn't have time, but it's in the paper, because you know, there's a lot of stuff you need to worry about, differential attrition and balance and all that kind of stuff. But the differential attrition, there's no differential attrition, which is important not only for the validity of the experiment, but it's a useful outcome in itself, so that the teachers weren't gaming the test-taking population, and there weren't any significant differences in the scores, not only in the numbers, but even the baseline scores of those who took the test. Okay? Um, we see the gains in mechanical and conceptual. We see the gains in the science and social studies. Okay, so you can just read that. I'm not going to repeat this. So let me just take a final s slide on policy, right? Uh, I think finding this over two years suggests that it's unlikely to be a novelty effect. And the continued gains on all these components suggest that you can design a program, at least, that mostly seems to do well, okay? And we can combine elements of group and individual pay and can be largely budget neutral in the context of an across-the-board hike, like the cola point that I was just making. But I think the much broader point, and I don't want to kind of leave you thinking that, oh, this is the exact merit pay program that can mean that we need to be implementing, right? I think the much, much broader point is that of just creating a meaningful career ladder for teachers where your career prospects depend on performance. I mean, I don't see this as being set in stone as saying you must go do something like this, but it's just management 101, right? I mean, that you can't manage for results, I mean, without A, orienting the system towards outcomes, and then orienting the professional incentives for the key stakeholders in the system to work towards those outcomes, right? So from a political perspective, I mean, given how far we are in India, like, I mean, from being able to implement anything like this, I'm not kind of saying that, oh, this is about teacher incentives. It's really about performance measurement and management, right? Like, I mean, broadly construed, and I think that's the framework in which one ought to think about implementing things like this. And I think the implementation details are critical. So let's, you know, however wonderful a study might be, let's take a step back and be humble about how much or how like, I mean, this will tell us about scalability in the real world because, you know, in the end, a badly implemented program is not going to do anything like this, right? So all that this study is is a proof of concept that if you design something well and sensibly, it can have a pretty large effect. Uh, but in steady state, the implementation details is what is going to drive a lot of impact. But there's a lot of thinking, theoretical thinking, that is relevant uh, that I think cuts across the board from India to the U.S. So let me... I mean, maybe I'll just stop and take questions because I'm sure that let that be the first question, right? How is this relevant to the U.S.? And then we'll talk more. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the talk. Uh, my name's Gary Ritter, and I'm here. In the and you're getting married tomorrow, uh, and you're here, so thank you. <laughs> that, that is true. And, and, uh, Nate Jensen and I are dabbling with local districts and trying to do this, and we've been getting calls from a couple who have said, I just saw that study from Tennessee, and I don't know if we should do it now. Some of my constituents are really afraid. Right. So what sort of response did you give in terms of framing the Tennessee study with, uh, with the results that you found? So I think, yeah, and so this is exactly, I mean, I think the most, so let's first, so let me first talk about the research results and then talk about the <coughs> frame. So there are many, many things that, that come out of this, right? Now, I don't know the micro details of the design of Tennessee well enough, like, I mean, to figure out how high powered it was, whether it was, I mean, so was it something that was uniform at all points in the distribution? Like, I mean, that you could get a bonus for continuous stuff, or was it, no, it was more about meeting a target and getting a bonus, right? I mean, and that itself, to me, weakens fundamentally what the incentive theory tells you, like, I mean, would be the margin of impact, right? Um, I think I'm also open enough to consider that 
in a place like India, right, uh, that the impacts are going to be bigger because you're starting off a much lower base of learning and you're starting off a much lower base of teacher effort, right? So it's given 25% absence. I mean, maybe, you know, the, you, you don't have that level of... of so. It depends on how much slack you have on the teacher effort margin, right? So I'm perfectly willing to concede that you're not going to, maybe even theoretically, see such a big impact, though in the medium to long run, it can mean you probably would. The other thing, I mean, in the U.S., if I look at some of Roland Fryer's work, like, you know, I mean, it might well be that the binding constraint in U.S. education is more student effort than teacher effort, right? It can mean, and so those of us who've been professors can attest to this, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and maybe not for grad students. <laughs> uh, okay, so, I mean, and, but I think the main point I would make in terms of suggesting a research program of that sort for the U.S., I mean, is really to do something similar to AP, not in terms of this particular experiment, but running a battery of interventions, right, that can mean in a comparable context so that you can run these meaningful horse races and say that, you know, is the binding constraint student effort as a teacher effort. Now if it's teacher effort, like I mean, is it it might be more subtle than just saying, oh I need to work harder. It might be more along the lines of saying I need to work smarter. Right? So it might be that in the medium run, I invest in human capital that helps me teach better if I think it's going to make a material difference to my life. And so maybe the reasons you didn't see the effect in Tennessee in the short run are it's not as simple as assigning more homework or assigning more classwork, but it requires slightly deeper changes in the U.S. context. Because most teachers, my sense is, yes, teachers might be slackers, but they don't not show up to work. I mean, and you, you come, you go, maybe they do, I don't know. Uh, but, so that would be another line of response, that the mechanism for impact of merit pay in the U.S. might just need to be longer term, I mean, and that allows for this accumulation in human capital. Now, it then raises an interesting question for research, right? Like, I mean, wither experimental research, like, I mean, if you're trying to get at such longer term mechanisms, right? I mean, is it even the right, is it even the right toolkit or the right set of approaches? Um, and I don't know. I mean, I think one way of thinking about this is I don't know what the expectations in Tennessee were with respect to the longevity of the program, right? Like, I mean, but if it is seen as a start-stop thing, then maybe you're not going to see it. If it's possible to frame a program along the lines of saying that the government is absolutely committed, like, I mean, to figuring out ways of recognizing and rewarding effective teaching, and we will keep tinkering, like, I mean, till we find the exact formula, but rest assured that this is not going away, like, you know, that we are absolutely committed to doing things along the lines of measurement, monitoring, and rewarding, right? I mean, effectiveness. The other interesting thing might well be that maybe in a place like the US and you need an interaction of inputs and incentives, right? Like I mean in terms of the input being better training or coaching or whatever, like I mean that's geared towards certain goals. Now, I don't, I'm not a believer in training. Like, I mean I really don't think most training programs have any impact. Uh, but the interaction might be where the action is, like, you know, that you not only have some capacity, but then you have a reason to go and deploy that capacity in, in your classroom. And then I think the broadest answer, I mean, this is kind of, in some sense, the empiricist's last refuge, which is to say that any empirical work, like, I mean, is context-specific, and there's no way you should be generalizing, like, I mean, from one or two studies, and so, you know, it, it is just important for the sake of policy in the U.S. on such an important topic that there be multi-site that they be multi-site studies, but well designed from first principles that understand, and if it's in fact not well designed according to XYZ, it's easy to point out and say this is why. It probably didn't. I think this comment um, on the fact that the differences that might be there if you look at teachers at the secondary level, because I think this is only elementary. Primary, right. And higher levels of learning as a function of the whole incentive program because that's where it becomes much more difficult to Right, and that's a deep and important question to which the honest answer is I don't have a very good answer except to say that it's a, you know, I have thought about how the, the, you know, the design issues become more complicated for very simple reasons that you have more non-tested subjects, right? I mean, you have you have a PE teacher, you have a music teacher, you have a whole bunch of other things that maybe you don't have in elementary school. There's other trickier issues of complementarity among teachers. So the math teacher's productivity might affect the physics teacher's productivity. Like, I mean, whereas here, the same teacher is teaching all subjects. So it's much cleaner. Like, I mean, to write an incentive contract that says, you know, here's here's the teacher, here's the kids, here's your value add, and you're pretty much responsible. Uh, I mean, my broad answer at the high school level is that 
I haven't seen good studies. Now, I think Ali, there's a study in Mexico that's being done and called Aligning Learning Incentives, which is a high school-based experiment that the IDB is sponsoring. Um, and I think they're finding some pretty positive results at the end of one year. I haven't seen a formal paper out of that yet. Um, but I think a non-trivial component of what they're doing is just saying, why do I really care about teacher incentives or student incentives or whatever? Why not just do all of them, right? Like, I mean, that this is about the interaction. So I think this idea of aligning learning incentives is what the project is called, is really about aligning incentives for leaders, uh, principals, teachers, and students along the lines of saying, here are targets and this is what it's based on. So all I would say is I don't have empirical evidence on how I would do, how this would work. I probably have enough first principles to try and design something for higher levels of education. But I think the other deep point, which is not appreciated much in education policy, is that the optimal policy is very different in different parts of the learning distribution. Right? Like, I mean, and I think a lot of the backlash I mean, comes from the fact that those of us who have these conversations are all drawn from the top 5% of the education distribution, right? like, I mean, which means that we worry a lot more about uh, teaching to the test, we worry a lot more about crowding out creative thinking, right? And I'm the first person to admit that if you 11th grade English composition can be taught as a formulaic five paragraph essay, like, I mean, you will do this, 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 or it can be taught in a much more creative way. And maybe for the top 2% of kids, or for top 5% of kids, it's a really bad idea. It can mean to have teachers based on merit pay. But at the bottom 50% of the learning distribution, being able to compose an argument and write a five paragraph essay is a massive improvement over where you are. And it's not politically correct, like, I mean, to have that conversation, to say that the optimal policy is different in different parts of the distribution. So I think that's another source. This is just my casual empiricism, right, that can mean of the politics. But there's a disconnect between the demographic that's making the policy discussion, and that's in the policy discussion, and the demographic that's most affected uh, by some of these things. So Ed Lazier has a very nice QJE paper. Uh, it's called Speeding Tax, no, it's called, yeah, Speeding Tax Fraud Terrorism and Teaching to the Test, okay? Um, and, and you might think, what's the connection among these things? But, but, but it's a beautiful theoretical paper, right? And all it's saying is a very simple point, okay? So if you are a professor, and you've got a curriculum, and you're gonna set an exam, you have a choice, right? You have a choice of not telling your students anything about what's gonna be in the test. Okay? Or you have a choice of telling them focus on these 15 areas, right? And I think many of us, in fact, do the latter, right? Like, I mean, kind of say, okay, and the students will badger you and badger you and say, like, is this going to be in the test? It's going to be in the test. It's going to be in the test. And at some point, you succumb and you say, and you say, okay, focus, focus on these areas. Okay? But there's a very deep economic logic behind what is optimal here, right? And the optimality calculation is very simple. That a student is going to study for something that can mean if the marginal benefit of studying for that question is larger than the marginal cost, okay? Now, if you, if you have a highly diffuse prior of what's going to be on the test, then the marginal benefit of studying any one given item is relatively low, right? Which means for a low-cost learner, somebody who learns quickly, he's going to study everything. But the high-cost learner is going to study nothing, right? Because no individual item passes that cost-benefit threshold of study. Right? And so the analogy with speeding and tax fraud and terrorism and all of that stuff is like, I mean, if I, if, if I want to prevent speeding, am I better off putting high-profile cameras at risky intersections? Or am I better off not telling you anything about the cameras and then there's a chance that you get caught somewhere? Right? The problem in the latter case is, yes, it's true that this is diffuse, but it's so diffuse that I just speed everywhere. Right? Like, I mean, because, hey, what's the probability? Right? And then if I get caught, I'll pay the fine. But if I know that here's these eight intersections that are high risk, I mean, and there's a camera, it flashes every time I pass by, then I really slow down, right? So it's the same analogy, right? That the optimal policy depends on whether you're high cost or low cost learners. So if you're, so the problem with giving students some direction of saying focus on these 15 things is that the bright kids who would have otherwise studied everything, let's say my objective function is I want to maximize the amount of learning that kids do. If I give you these 15 areas, then the, high co the, the low cost learners, or rather the smart kids, I mean, who would have studied everything, don't study the other things, but the low cost, the, the low learners at least study these 15 things, right? Because now the probability of each item being on the test is high enough that it passes my individual cost benefit threshold. Right? So it's a very, very similar logic, right? That can mean that at the high end of the learning distribution, I don't want performance pay, I don't want anything. I mean, I just want a highly motivated, intrinsically motivated teacher who's able to instill a love of learning and students go and study everything, right? But that's not the real world.
So, sorry, I mean, it's a long-winded answer, but I hope I'm hitting some concepts, like, I mean, that are relevant to how we might think about something like this. And in high school, more specifically, I think I'm happy to get involved in a discussion that would talk about some of these design issues, bringing in some lessons from Mexico, but it's not something I've personally done to be able to say much more about that. This isn't a question, so okay. I won't even pretend that it is, but... It's Am I right to say that? <laughs> <laughs> but I right like, I sorry, can I, can I just request people introduce themselves? Because oh, I don't sure. know... My name is Bill McCombus. I'm a science educator here in the college. Uh -huh. uh, I'll raise my voice at the end so it'll sound like a question. Uh, <laughs> it, it seems to me that another, another reason why we need to identify who the better teachers are, it, it is, a, is an equity agenda. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, I, 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 I say frequently that one of the central reasons I left K-12 teaching is I was not paid fairly. Uh -huh. um, I, I sensed that I was one of the better teachers. Uh, I only took two sick days, by the way, in 11 years. So, so, so I'd be a star in India, I guess. Right. Uh, but, but, You'd be a star anywhere. But, I mean, there's, I mean that, that's really my point, is that uh, this is a fantastic study. Your, your team is to be congratulated for the, for the uh, you know, you really, you really controlled for about as many things as I think you, you could have. It's a, it's a masterpiece of research. And, and I'm happy to be able to tell my students that, that merit pay does seem to increase productivity. But I really am concerned about that other issue, that we, we need to be looking at merit pay because we are overpaying some teachers in every school authority and we are underpaying others. Right. So, I mean, again, Ed Lazier is one of my favorite, favorite applied, you know, just applied, applied theorists. I mean, and yeah, can I? It's amazing how much simple insight there is in a normal distribution, right? Like, I mean, so if that is the distribution of ability, right, or performance or productivity, right? Like I mean, a pay schedule that is highly compressed is essentially like I mean, what you're going to see is these are the guys who are going to leave. So I suspect all the past teachers who are sitting in this ed policy room are people who are in this side of the distribution. Like I mean, who came out saying that I'm not going to be a teacher. Like I mean, but I'm not paid fairly. And, but what the structure means is that these are the guys who are never going to leave, right? Like, yeah. Because they're the ones who are paid above what their actual productivity or outside opportunity is, right? So, now, of course, phrasing it that way, again, gets you into kind of this business of, um, uh, you know, of micro, of, 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 yeah, I mean, I'm just trying to micromanage domains of professional competence, but I think having the broad conversation, like you did, which is exactly what we did, right? So what you're saying, being unfairly paid, we did by saying we need to recognize and reward outstanding teachers. Right? That's exactly right. Uh, I'm Bob Castro, of the department. Um, I'm intrigued by the attendance results or non-results. <laughs> Um, you know, at first blush, we might think, well, gee, you know, we should, uh, attendance would be, a, you know, a really good good way to increase performance. But here, you, you've given the right incentives here, which is per, per, for, um, reward performance rather than the input. Right. Okay. And they've chosen, they, they've figured out that the best way to do it is not necessarily to show up, mm -hmm. but to give more homework. And maybe they can do homework on the day that I'm not there, I, I, there's a substitute or something. So would I be right in saying that, that Bill made the wrong decision by uh, <laughs> <laughs> maybe the sick day? So no, I mean, I think, right, so it's important. So there's a parallel study, right, to this that Esther Duflo and others did, like, I mean, uh, which is in some sense quite famous in the popular media because it kind of involved putting cameras in schools, right, like, I mean, and rewarding paying teachers on the basis of attendance, right? Not on the basis of test scores, right? Now, you could argue that, I mean, there's different aspects of the multitask moral hazard problem. I think the broad point is that the two studies together confirm basic economic theory. So over there, teachers show up more, but they don't work harder when they show up, they can be, because there's no reason to do that. Here, they don't show up more, but they do work harder when they show up. So the optimal amount of absence... Oh, right. I mean, but I think they work harder too. I mean, so as in they stay, they do the extra classes and they do stuff. But yes, I mean, but if the overall part of the teacher's production function includes eliciting student effort, like I mean, then that's fine by me, right? Um, 
But I think, I mean, the deeper long-term issue here is remember that these incentives are very low powered. I mean, it's really just 3% of annual pay, right? So it's at a level. And if you think about why teachers are absent, the, the most common reason for absence is just that teachers live far away from the schools. So these are rural schools. They live in small urban centers because 95% of teachers in my sample have their own kids in private schools, right? That can mean that a, for a kid that are, that are further away, right? Um, and I mean, there is, there is a deeper issue here of social distance, right? Which is that these schools in rural areas are mostly first generation learners, right? Like, I mean, and the teachers are well paid enough that there's, they're two, they would be by far the highest paid person in the entire village. So their social group is not in the village, right? I mean, their social group is going to be in a small urban center, which means the distance to the school is very large. And there's two buses a day. So, you know, so if you talk to a regular school teacher, they'll give you the travails of their life. I mean, about how they spend an hour every day, like, I mean, taking a bus to this remote place and walking the last kilometer. Now, the problem, of course, is nobody forces them to live far away. They could choose to live in the village, but they don't, right? So, but that's the model of absence you need to have in the back of your mind, that a bonus at the end of the year is not really changing my marginal calculation on a day-to-day -day basis about attendance. Now, the other thing you must remember is it's possible that the teacher's own view of the production function with respect to improving test scores is that it's not so much about effort during the year, but a really good cramming effort, like I'm mean, in the last four weeks, right? And our attendance is measured throughout the school year with one visit per month from September through February, right? So we have six observations, but the testing is late March and April. So it's possible that there was a big ramping up in effort in March that we just didn't pick up, right? Let's have uh, two more questions, James and Bob. Sorry, I was going to take Bob. Oh, no, yeah, how about, let's have three. James, yeah, Bob. James, Bob, James, Brian. Right. I, I, I am. I, I guess I'm following Bob's point a little bit. I'm fascinated with this 25 percent on attendance. Is that is, is, is that sort of is it a lot of people who is it much, is 25 percent who never show up? Is it more like everybody makes a day off? How do they have some two teachers? No. Yeah, how, how sociologically, and unions typically want some level of public support for political organizations. How are they that strong if they feel they didn't have to justify it? Can you? Tell it, yeah, it, it's true. I mean, I was telling again at dinner yesterday. I was telling, at dinner, I was telling Jay that you know usually when I put up the first slide in absence, most people just get like whoa, and then they just want to understand that, right? Uh, but, but that's a whole separate set of papers. Fair enough, right? So I think so. Absence is a complicated problem, and so essentially, the sociology of Indian education is the following, right? That you've had. The, the, you hire teachers through competitive statewide exams, right? I mean, so in hiring, you're supposedly getting like the most talented people into teaching, right? But the needs of where the teachers need to be staffed are in remote rural areas because that's where you have the increase in enrollment, like in the first generation, first generation kids, right? So you've got this disconnect where the salary levels are paid that are paid are very high. So there's a massive oversupply of candidates to get the teacher job, okay? But once you get the teacher job, then you don't want to go to the rural areas, right? Like, I mean, so what happens is that then you resist trying to get those rural postings. So on a day-to-day -day basis, it just it's a simple monitoring problem, right? Like, I mean, that it, how does an inspector show up, like, I mean, in a remote rural area, like, I mean, where the teacher is supposed to be? So the only feasible option for monitoring would be the community, right? Like, I mean, because that's the community where the teacher is supposed to show up, and what happens if the teacher doesn't? And so there's two issues here. One is that the social distance between the teacher and community is so large because the teacher is by far the most educated person, right? I mean that the community typically doesn't have any meaningful power. Right? They can to do anything. And the other thing is there have been reform attempts that try to decentralize teacher accountability at least, like I mean to the community, which the unions have successfully resisted over time. Like I mean, because they would say that, oh, how can these illiterate villagers like I mean tell us how to teach, right? I mean so which meant that the unions have become very, very strong and like I said they're much stronger than American unions because they are not tied to one political party. So they will go to whoever, like I mean, which makes them much more formidable, and nobody will touch the unions. And the final thing is, even the 25% is something that's anecdotal. You know, people in the village might know know this, but you vote once in five years. You don't have a local school board election. Like I mean, you vote once in five years for. Um, for parliament or for the legislative assembly, and so there's a dilution of issues across a whole range of things, and there isn't a political forum whereby this is salient. Okay? So for the politician, the political incentives are to do high visibility things like build a school, but then it just, people don't even think that the politician can credibly get the teacher to show up to school that much, so unless you had a meaningful decentralization that put that authority in the communities, there just isn't a structure to, to get that accountability.
Uh, I mean, we can have a much deeper discussion, but that's kind of the broad contours of the ruralness, the difficulty of verifying, um, and the fact that the communities are not empowered, and the fact that the teachers don't care because the social distance is so large. Like, I mean, so again, most teachers would think that these kids are not going to learn much anyway. They're going to drop out after a few years, so I'm just here kind of doing extended daycare. Uh, so again, I mean, if you, look, if, you, if you look at these distributions, I mean, and so this is kind of, you know, there's a qualitative bent to what I do, even though I'm kind of a card-carrying economist, I mean, is that if you look at the distributions, coming back to incentive pay, I mean, you know, here is, here is a control school distribution, and the incentive school distribution might be slightly to the right, but there's still much more variation, right? It can mean within the control school than what is explained by the treatment. So, you know, the foundation is very interested in some of these qualitative things, and they go interview teachers, and what you find is not surprising, that the highly effective teachers are teachers who see themselves as the change agents in these kids' lives, right? Like, I mean, and saying that I am the only person standing between this child and, and illiteracy, versus the teachers who see themselves as essentially fighting a lost cause. Like, I mean, that these parents are illiterate, there's not, you know, their kids are not going to do much anyway. And that's not at all different from the sociology of teachers in the U.S. I mean, it's exactly the same set of issues. And I think it's true whenever you have a highly educated teacher population serving a relatively undereducated population that there's a lot of heterogeneity. What you just said is normal. You write that off, that's normal. Yeah, <laughs> but I'm not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we've got two more questions, Brian. Well, no. I think mean, you've tried hard to explain to how this is relevant for um, the United States. I'd really like to hear more about how this is relevant for India. So is this foundation continuing this program? Is it going on? Are the policy discussions there? taking a lot of, you know, putting a lot of attention in the study, or is this going to be expanded? A great question. I mean, and this is why, like, I mean, I wish there was a department like this in India, right? Like, I mean, so, I mean, my biggest personal frustration is that I am a fully vertically integrated firm, like, I mean, from conceptualizing studies to carrying them out to then having to do extended dissemination because there isn't, say, a think tank infrastructure, right? I mean, that can translate rigorous academic research and put it out in the policy domain the way you have over here. Now, that being said, uh, the papers have been very influential, like in the sense of kind of, they're in the syllabi at the Kennedy School, like, you know, so a lot of these public policy masters that have mid-career bureaucrats from developing countries, like, I mean, now have these papers in them. So the impact is more long-range, like, I mean, the people who come here see these things go back and then want to implement innovative pilots. So right now, one district collector, so just to get a sense of India, a, a guy who runs one district is basically running about the lives of about two million people, right? I mean, so, so this guy has been really excited about trying to do something in a systematic way, and he's been in touch. And what I've told him is don't even try to do merit pay because you don't have the infrastructure to do this, right? So just focus first on putting in place an infrastructure of assessment and longitudinal tracking. And so what he's just done is got the same testing firm who did this for us, like, I mean, and given them a three-year contract um, to work out a protocol for testing every kid in the district and creating reports for parents, administrators. So the same sort of reports that we did and then using that to fuel discussion on performance measurement management. And then the next step to that would be something like so uh, is the foundation following up? I think part of the problem with the foundation has been that given the lack of history of private philanthropy, like I mean in India in the social space, people are typically suspicious and think that you have some corporate agenda or something. So the foundation has been a lot more cagey about getting into public advocacy and fights. Like I mean they're happy to do research and do smaller scale stuff. So broadly, I mean, I think the answer is there's three levels of impact. There's dissemination, recommendation, advocacy, right? And I think as an academic, I'm most comfortable staying within the dissemination bubble, like I mean, not even getting to the point of recommendation, because then, now at some point in life I might do a bob, like, you know, I mean, and go, you know, go spend time on the other side, like, I mean, and try to help policy be an intelligent consumer of research as opposed to being a producer of research. But right now it's hard enough to do what I'm doing uh, without trying to do but too, but too is much. is the program doing. continuing? Is this program over though? So, no, yeah, so the program's over. Like, uh, but uh, in terms of the core incentive stuff, it's over. Uh, so I'm James Schultz, uh, grad student, Department of Education Reform. It seems to me that the reason your program worked is because you, there was no test currently in place. You were able to develop an assessment that could test students' growth at all levels of the distribution. Mm -hmm. In the United States, we already have tests. They're mm -hmm. tests that we really care about. Mm -hmm. and a lot of these tests have ceiling effects, a lot of them have floor effects. We can't test. Uh, growth is different at different levels. Mm -hmm. And so districts already care about these, these sorts of tests. The tests are not always great. Mm -hmm. So as, as reformers, should we be concerned about helping these districts develop 
ways of getting around these tests, using alternative forms of assessment, or should our focus really be on, uh, at the state level or the national level, trying to develop better assessments for, for states so that these sort of practices can be put into place? Right. In fact, so that reminds me. I mean, so one other answer I had to the Tennessee uh, to, to, to the Tennessee question, and this is, I think, relevant to the New York study as well, is that maybe layering on performance pay on top of an NCLD-style accountability infrastructure that exists already means that the low-hanging fruit has already been taken up. Like because you have an accountability infrastructure, and so maybe there isn't that much low-hanging fruit. Like I mean, at the end of the day, the sticks are more effective than the carrots, and so the fact that you've been doing NCLD for five years might mean that there is isn't that much low-hanging fruit, right? I mean, to respond to on the incentive side. So, but coming back to this question of testing and ceiling effects, I don't know enough about the U.S. test development literature and the distribution literature to be able to comment on how, in how many cases the ceiling effects or floor effects are binding. But conceptually, it's not a problem, right? Like, so if you had computer adaptive testing, like, I mean, the entire idea of an IRT scale is that, or a dynamic test, is I pitch a question to you at the median of your expected expected ability distribution and based on how you do I can calibrate and just like you go to the gym and you have these 50 pound weight scales and then you have the pound weight like I mean you get these first set of questions that puts you in the broad right bucket of learning and then you fine grain the measurement I mean, with that so conceptually it's not very difficult right I'm sure between ETS and between the other testing infrastructure that exists in this country they can do that uh, but it's probably just a question of implementing this with technology as opposed to paper and pencil right so right. I, I so I don't see that as a limiting as a limiting constraint. Seems like we definitely have the capabilities, but I think a lot of states aren't doing it. And so again, so that might be the kind of place where foundations, like I mean, come and play a role. Because again, the way the foundation, I mean, in many ways, it's ironic, right? Because the research agenda here in this project is probably like as cutting edge globally as they come, but the implementation infrastructure is probably 30 years behind. I mean, what you have even in the U.S., right? So there's this strange disconnect. Uh, but I think the foundation also sees this as a long-term transformation and that governments, it's much harder for governments to innovate because by definition a state system has to cater uniformly to the whole state and by just basic economics of trial and error tells you that you want to innovate on smaller scales. You don't want to innovate and try to take a system to scale on something that has not been pressure tested, right? So it's a natural place for foundations and private philanthropy to play a role with kind of interested participants in doing pilots of different styles of testing, different styles of assessment, um, and it seems that that would be the right approach uh, even in the U.S. Thank you. Well, this has been great. Uh, I, in fact, I feel like I, I have been to the gym but from my brain and, and, and not, I need to take a nap. Um, so, uh, so we'll have to call it well, quick. Take it off. We already saw that. You're <laughs> <laughs> right field. That's true. That's very true. Well, thank you again for coming.